please stay tuned to the end of this program or see the show notes for important information regarding today's speakers and the content of this podcast. Hello again and welcome to episode 15 of Allergy Talk, a roundup of the latest in the field of allergy and immunology by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For today's episode, we will be reviewing three more articles from the May-June 2020 issue of Allergy Watch, a bi-monthly publication which provides research summaries to college members from the major journals in allergy and immunology. You can also earn continuing medical education credit by listening to this podcast for information about CB credit or to read archived issues of Allergy Watch, head over to college.acaai.org slash publications slash Allergy Watch. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Lee. I'm the co-host of Allergy Talk, and I'm an associate professor at Emory University. Welcome to another episode of the work from home edition of Allergy Talk. Stan, Mary, and I are all working from home, and so we apologize for the audio in advance. So I'd like to introduce my co-host, Dr. Marin Kalangara. Hello, this is Marin Kalangara. I'm an assistant professor of allergy and immunology at Emory University School of Medicine. And you will have to excuse um, my son in the background. I'm sure everyone will be able to hear him at some point during this podcast. And we absolutely love David. (laughs) And Dr. Stan Feynman, our other co-host. Oh, thank you. And uh, it's great to be here. I'm uh, an adjunct uh, faculty at Emory, and uh, I'm the current editor-in-chief of uh, Allergy Watch. And I'm a past president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So we have three more articles from the May-June 2020 episode. So let's get started. It's a very interesting potpourri. So Stan, I think we always go back and forth about protection from pets or pets causing allergy. Where do we stand now with the latest studies? So this was a study that was uh, reviewed by uh, Vivian uh, Hernandez uh, Trujillo. The title is from the Annals of uh, uh, allergy, asthma, and immunology, which of course is the college's uh, uh, scientific journal. The title is Prenatal and Early Life Exposure to Indoor Air Polluting Factors and Allergic Sensitization at Two Years of Age. So we all know, and the interesting thing I think about this study, which was from Canada, and uh, Ann Ellis is uh, the uh, supervisor of this study, which interestingly received the new investigator award from the uh, American College of Allergy, uh, uh, the, uh, from the foundation of the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. So uh, she, she received that, and this study was partially funded through those efforts. So, you know, people sometimes wonder, well, what's going on with the foundation? What kind of, you know, things are we funding? This is one of the results. And I think it's very compelling because we all are trying, you know, we, we know there's a lot of studies out there about uh, secondhand tobacco smoke and developing allergies and furry pets. In fact, Dennis Owenby, who uh, was at the uh, University of Georgia for, uh, I'm sorry, Medical College of Georgia for a number of years. Before he was there, he was up in Michigan and started a uh, birth cohort that, in fact, when they published this in JAMA in 2002, they found that uh, exposure to two or more dogs or cats in the first year of life reduced the risk of allergic sensitization to allergens when the child was six or seven years of age. So there's a lot of different studies like that, looking at the uh, you know children developing allergies. Some say that you should avoid exposure to pets. Some like Dennis has said, well, maybe you know it, it helps. So what Ann did, fortunately, she's in Kingston, Ontario, and they have a study from, uh, from Kingston, the Kingston Health Services, where they monitor or they follow this birth cohort of patients. And uh, what they did is they followed them for two years and they did surveys when they they were six months, one year and two years of age. And what the survey was looking for was whether or not there were prenatal or postnatal exposure to animals like dogs and cats, molds, carpet, air fresheners, candles and incense, as well as uh, tobacco smoke, you know, uh, secondhand smoke. And so they looked at each one of those factors and then they did allergy testing at two years of age uh, for these children. And I think the interesting thing was that the, uh, when you look at the, the results was that there were really only three factors that had statistical significance. Exposure to cats, 
uh, exposure to candles, fragrant candles, and exposure to um, tobacco smoke. So air fresheners was close, but they didn't receive a statistical significance. And dog also was close, but did not achieve statistical significance. So the ones that did were only those three, exposure to cats, air fresheners, and candles. And I think this is an important point because really a lot of us don't ask much about air fresheners and candles, but in fact, in 2013, uh, when I was president of the college, I gave a talk about the, uh, I entitled it The Breath of Fresh Air, where I talked about indoor air contamination. And when I looked into fragrant candles and fragrances and things like that, I, I found out that not only were candles very popular, like their sales are over $2 billion a year, but they produce things like soot and lead and various organic compounds like toluene and styrene and, uh, and obviously volatile organic compounds like benzene and certain methyl, ethyl ketones. And the soot, it, 63% of the scented candles produce soots and over and about 50% of the non-scented candles produce soot. So soot is, is one of these factors that really can impact your uh, airway. Uh, because the size of some of these uh, particles from scented candles are less than one micron, uh, which obviously that really penetrates in the lungs. So uh, I, I really caution people about using scented candles. And now with this study, I've got support. I can tell them it's been studied. It's been shown that if you use a fragrant candle, uh, that your child has an increased risk of developing allergies when they tested them uh, at two years of age. So I just thought it was very compelling and it was a good study. And uh, I congratulate Ann Ellis on the, on the study and um, I just want to bring it to everybody's attention. So interesting. I, I wonder what's behind the association. You know, my temptation is that there's some sort of causation with the irritants, perhaps, some of the adjuvant effects you see with diesel, right. you know, there's this clear, well-documented adjuvant effect. If you expose someone to an allergen in the context of diesel particles that seem to stimulate the immune system and boost the eosinophilic and Ig response, that's sort of the temptation. Mm -hmm. That being said, clearly a lot of these patients are having mixed rhinitis probably Definitely non-allergic rhinitis for envir environmental tobacco smoke and irritants. I see that a ton in the infants in the first year of life where there's no way they're sensitized, but they're marinating and who knows what. But the sensitization part is the part I did not know, Stan, and that's very interesting to me. I'm just wondering if that's a marker for something or is actually related to the irritant itself. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know that anybody's, you know, looked at you know, those types of factors, like they have uh, diesel fumes or, you know, uh, you know, the diesel exhaust fumes and those immunologic studies. But, um, you know, we do see patients who are, you know, uh, have significant respiratory problems, you know, even, you know, older patients, younger patients. So what I thought was interesting about the study is that, you know, just like, it reminds me of a study that was done a couple of years ago. Uh, also, um, well, that was, I think that was in Jackie. And, it doesn't just look, these studies don't just look anymore at cat exposure or no cat exposure and the risk of developing allergic sensitization, but rather just other factors like possibly genetic factors, other prenatal and environmental factors during infancy, et cetera, that could modify this effect of animal dander exposure. And I think the study that in Jackie looked at the effect of a high risk genetic uh, predisposition, so the 17Q21 chromosome on the development of cat allergies and worsening asthma associated with it. So I just think, yeah, I think it's not just about whether or not there is a cat or the number of cats, or, but rather just the surrounding other predisposing factors. You're probably right. Although, you know, we all know that cat dander is just such a potent antigen. Uh, right. It's such a small uh, you know, uh, protein, it's, it's aerosolized. It's not, doesn't settle on the floor like dog dander does. So I'm not that surprised that this cat achieved statistical significance, but the dog didn't. Right. I thought, so aren't they both less than five microns in size or is that just cat? 
I don't know the answer. Right. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know as well. Um, I, I think cat is is smaller than dog. Uh, the yeah, cat yeah. antigen is smaller than the dog. My, yeah, my, it's, a, it's a reputation to be aerosolized for sure. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, I made the confession on a previous podcast. I'm not the biggest fan of fur animals. Now I'm going to add to that. I'm not the biggest fan of fragrances. I, <laughs> I No offense to the listeners. Walking into Bath and Body Works, I think, is just suffocating to me. I, I can't go into that store. Yankee Candle, too. That is rough. So uh, I definitely i am glad I have an excuse not to get a pet or fragrances in my own home. <laughs> All right. So let's head over to the next article. Marin, you have some you have a very interesting article about how sinus surgery influences the immune system. Right. So this paper was published in the Journal of Asthma last year and also reviewed in Allergy Watch by Vivian Hernandez uh, Trujillo. And it looks at the effect of sinus surgery on asthma outcomes, specifically in the context of type 2 biomarkers. So there have been several studies already showing that sinus surgery improves asthma control and reduces the frequency of asthma flares. The authors in this study had the specific hypothesis that this improvement in asthma control following sinus surgery is related to decreased type 2 airway inflammation. And so they looked at the relationship between asthma control and the expression of type 2 biomarkers following sinus surgery. Um, the study was done in Japan of adult subjects with concomitant nasal polyps and asthma that was not well controlled uh, with an evidence of eosinophilic infiltration on sinus pathology over the course of five years. The participants underwent three visits over one year pre-surgery at two months, and then at one year following the surgery. And the ACQ score was used as a measure of asthma control. And the investigators also checked various type 2 biomarkers like the absolute eosinophil count, IgE, immunocaptor inhalants, and the phenol levels. They recruited just 25 subjects over five years with not well-controlled asthma as defined as an ACQ score of greater than 0.75. What they found was overall... For the entire group of 25 patients, the bloody sniffle counts as well as the pheno significantly decreased at one year after sinus surgery, and this was associated with an increase in the FEV1, but only 10 patients or 40% of the entire cohort improved with an ACQ score significantly increased at 8 and 52 weeks following surgery. And 15 of these patients showed just a transient improvement at eight weeks, but then showed a deterioration in their ACQ score at one year. And this deterioration in the ACQ score occurred in parallel with increases in their type 2 biomarkers, like the absolute eosinophil count, as well as the pheno. In the short term, after sinus surgery, the changes in the ACQ score were not just related with the changes in the bloody eosinophil counts, but significantly correlated with changes in pheno. However, in the long term, changes in the ACQ score were significantly correlated with changes in both the absolute eosinophil count as well as the pheno. And the group showing improvement had higher total IgE that is greater than 600 at baseline, but there were no other significant differences between the group that showed improvement and those that did not. The bottom line that the authors were trying to convey was that Changes in asthma control following sinus surgery is related to changes in type 2 inflammation. And they discussed another recent study looking at aspirin challenges post sinus surgery, wherein decreased levels of type 2 biomarkers following sinus surgery was associated with a decreased severity of as reactions to aspirin. And there were some patients who had an aspirin induced reaction prior to sinus surgery, who did not react at all and underwent silent challenges uh, thereafter. Um, so similarly, they have noted a correlation between asthma control and this trend in type 2 biomarkers following uh, sinus surgery. And overall, I thought it was quite straightforward that a reduction in the total type 2 cytokine burden from the upper airway would result in overall improved asthma control, um, just as, say, rhinitis control with nasal steroids improves asthma symptoms. 
And ACQ changes um, in these instances, in these studies, have correlated with a decrease in pheno. And subjects in the study with short-term improvements in their asthma eventually showed deterioration, and this was in conjunction with increased type 2 biomarkers. There was no correlation between the ACQ and the FAV1 at baseline uh, with an improvement following the sinus surgery. Overall, the main drawback of this study was that the sample size was small, and despite the fact that it was conducted over a period of five years, they were able to recruit only 25 patients. But this study was um, conducted in Asia, where the majority of nasal polyps are non-eosinophilic and they are neutrophilic. And perhaps it was just harder to find patients with overt type 2 inflammation. And also, this was an observational study. It wasn't controlled, but it just reinforced the concepts of the unified airway and systemic type 2 inflammation in patients with nasal polyps and concomitant asthma. However, I don't think it necessarily means that the inflammation is homogeneous throughout the upper and lower airways in these patients. Um, So for instance, just I have seen often a discordance in the response to biologics in patients with concomitant nasal polyps and asthma, where asthma can improve on the biologic, but the nasal polyps progress and vice versa. And this was also reproduced in a recent study in Jackie in practice showing that on mepolizumab, there was a discordance in the response um, in nasal polyp symptoms, as well as the asthma response. One of the questions I always wonder is, other than treating the comorbidity of sinusitis, where I assume that they're having symptomatic improvement, does the surgery itself also come with a change in medication? They talk about some of the medicines they were on, and did that change pre and post surgery as well? Not significantly. Hmm. That's significantly, yeah. yeah. So that's so interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I um, I definitely want to make sure we are treating all the comorbidities of asthma. That is just textbook asthma treatment. But I think what intrigues me is what your observation about the variable response to biologic. Were you talking about IL-5 or IL-4-13? So just IL, um, so IL-5s, but um, my point was that So while there is certainly unified airway inflammation and a systemic type 2 inflammation in the upper and lower airways in this phenotype of chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps and asthma, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the inflammation is identical in the sense that it would respond to one uniform therapy. Um, And just as I've seen in my experience with treating patients with these conditions with biologics is that there can be a dissociation between the response in one versus the other. Hmm. How often do you do the medical treatment for nasal polyposis or that all your patients routinely get surgery? I'm just curious. So I think, I think it depends on how bad the initial uh, polyp disease is. If it's like very extensive, the ENTs prefer to just go ahead with surgery and then, you know, and then we, desensitize or whatever it is afterwards. You know, now that we have um, dipilumab uh, approved for nasal polyps, um, I think that's got a real significant role in uh, treating these patients too. I don't know uh, how much experience y'all have had with it, but we've had some incredible stories and uh, really wonderful results. And I think we're going to see other biologics approved for nasal polyps uh, in the next, you know, couple of years as well. Did Stan, all those patients got surgery too, though? The, is that accompanied with surgery? Or? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, hmm. uh, I, I don't remember all the, those uh, pivotal studies, but I believe that they were recurrent you know, polyps and they were looking at regrowth. But um, you know, I, I think there's a real significant role for it. Um, I, I just think this is a great study that uh, really does – you know, recall the uh, importance of the, quote, unified airway, you know, improve the upper airway and your lower airway gets better too. And I think this is just another example of that, but, you know, I'm glad you brought it up. So for the last article, I wanted to discuss immunotherapy for peanut allergies. The initial studies involving the sublingual route were done 
by Wesley Burks and Edwin Kim back in Duke and now at UNC. And now that we're on the, you know, we have passed the first phase of treatments, it's nice to see where the field is going. And for anyone who has not listened, Brian Vickery gave a very wonderful podcast earlier this year. Uh, you can check it out on our list of previous episodes. So the initial data looking at sublingual therapy that was initially published about nine years ago to 2011 showed that in a, it, after 12 months of therapy in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, there was an improvement in the threshold uh, compared to placebo. They went from 85 milligrams of peanut tolerated to 1.7 uh, grams or 1,710 milligrams. But uh, essentially, they were trying to hit higher thresholds. Uh, uh, I think some of the uh, earlier outcomes were as high as 5,000 uh, milligrams. And this is using a maintenance dose of 2 milligrams a day. Now, what has always been attractive about sublegal immunotherapy was the lack of side effects. So some of the early studies show only minor oral pharyngeal side effects. You know, uh, some of the studies showed uh, no epinephrine use whatsoever. And, and so we have always are trying to balance three aspects of immunotherapy, efficacy and safety, and adherence too, uh, ease of use. So despite the rather modest increase in the threshold compared to traditional oral immunotherapy, I, th I think we're recognizing that oral immunotherapy does have a significant dropout rate due to gastrointestinal or potentially systemic side effects, where as opposed to maybe 10, 15% of having symptoms, almost every single patient with oral immunotherapy experienced some sort of adverse reaction, not all severe, but some sort of reaction. So after these preliminary studies, what the uh, Wesley Burks group decided to do was to do a long-term extension. So essentially, after that first year of therapy, there was an open-label extension where everyone, placebo or not, were able to continue uh, sublingual immunotherapy at maintenance daily for up to five years. And so this is talking about the outcomes of their new thresholds after five years of sublingual at two milligrams a day. And so the way they set up the study is that they had a 5,000 milligram or five gram exit challenge. And after that exit challenge, they took patients who passed and after two to four weeks, brought them back again to measure sustained unresponsiveness off all sublingual immunotherapy. Now, of the 48 patients that, who started, they did only get 37 toward the end. Uh, a lot of that was due to personal reasons and not uh, side effects and so on. But essentially what they found was of the 37 who uh, completed, they had 67% of the population tolerate 750 milligrams of peanut. Now, you may recall from the Palisade study, 600 milligrams was the threshold, and two-thirds of them reached that threshold. So it was very similar threshold, 750 milligrams, 600 milligrams, about two-thirds completing the study uh, reached that threshold. But the big difference is side effects. Uh, about 4.78% had symptoms, mostly oral itching, about 0.21% required antihistamines, and no, no one required epi. Maybe three people had wheezing and cough or so on. Now, let's talk about sustained unresponsiveness. So I just told you that a, a significant of number uh, were able to tolerate the top dose, about 25% or 12 people. So they hit the 500 milligrams, they finished the challenge. So after two to four weeks, they brought those 12 back and about 10 out of the 12 had sustained unresponsiveness. Now, again, only two to four weeks, not very long, but off slit, they still had some durability of that desensitization. So taken together, 
Again, it is a very, very long extension trial. They do notice a weakness. This particular trial, when it was originally done, did not have an entry food challenge. It was based on symptoms plus an IG of seven. But they're showing pretty similar results to Palisade, about two-thirds able to tolerate at least 750, about two peanuts, which is about the same expected buffer, but with a lot less side effects. So moving forward, I'm wondering what do patients want, right? I think patients want a buffer. How much of a buffer do they want? That's one aspect. Number two, they want safety, right? They don't want to have to worry about cofactors of anaphylaxis and requiring epinephrine and so on. And also um, there's the adherence part. Is it easy to use and so on? And so there has been issues with adherence with oral immunotherapy. Whether taking sublingual every day is easy or not is debatable. It depends on who you are. Certainly there's no question about side effects. The side effects, there's absolutely no comparison. Sublingual seems to be safer, though how much duration you need to hit the threshold, you know, we'll have to do further studies on. And then obviously the third aspect would be stuff like, uh, you know, cost and, and, and so on. But I just thought it was very interesting that, you know, this long track record of five years and, and safety was every hitting very similar thresholds may move the needle towards some of these lower side effect uh, type therapies. Now, there is some idea that there's an absorptive capacity of the sublingual area that may be overcome by the use of adjuvant. So I know adjuvant therapy adding on to peanut sublingual is being investigated to see if it could even boost the efficacy of the therapy. But even of the study they're reporting now, it does seem to be an attractive option. And I'm curious, you know, where they take it further after this uh, publication. Well, I certainly hope they make it available <laughs> because yeah. uh, we uh, did the pal you know, we did the Palisade study uh, and we saw the kids reacting and, uh, you know, we got calls all, you know, hours of the night and weekend. Uh, the kids had reactions to uh, uh, the, uh, the eating this oral immunotherapy and they... All hours of uh, the night. Yeah, all hours of the night, yes. And, you know, they, yeah, they had delayed reactions. A lot of, you know, some of them had delayed reactions. So, uh, you know, but the, I guess the reason I'm bringing that up, I mean, we're looking forward to having um, Palforzia available. We're starting to use it in our office. Uh, I think for certain patients, selected patients, it can be a good therapy, obviously risks versus benefits. We always have to weigh those. And we talked about that on one of our podcasts. In fact, um, you know, some, some of the studies that looked at the, you know, the benefits and risk of, of uh, oral immunotherapy, but, you know, this is so much less uh, quantity and I, I, I've never used sublingual immunotherapy for our food, but um, I would imagine the kids are not going to dislike the taste as much as they do with, you know, 300 milligrams of peanut protein when they eat that every day. So uh, that's another pushback that we see with some of these kids in this uh, oral immunotherapy. Um, I'd love to see, you know, this, this type of therapy, you know, be approved or, uh, but, you know, as we all know, we, we don't even have sublingual immunotherapy approved. Well, we have it in tablets for selected uh, inhalant allergens like dust mite, grass, and ragweed, but we don't have it for other allergens. And, uh, you know, uh, it would be it'd be nice to have this available for a, a food. I hope that some company picks up on this and, you know, makes it available. Well, that's our articles for today. Thank you for listening. Please rate our podcast on iTunes and please give us any feedback, corrections, or suggestions. That email again is allergytalk, one word, at acaai.org. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. The ACAAI is presenting this podcast for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice or intended to replace the judgment of a licensed physician. The college is not responsible for any claims related to procedures, professionals, products, or methods discussed in the podcast, and it does not approve or endorse any products, professionals, services, or methods that might be referenced. The today's speakers have the following disclosures. Drs. Lee and Dr. Kangara have nothing to disclose. 
and Dr. Feynman has been a speaker for AZBI and Shire and has done research for AIMU, DBV, Shire, and Regeneron.